Coming up next on Arizona Horizons, Journalists Roundtable. The state attorney general's race is attracting a lot of campaign funds, including significant contributions from the parent company of APS. And we'll look at the CD9 debate that was held here on Arizona Horizon. Those stories next on the Journalists Roundtable. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Bob Christie of the Associated Press. Why is so much campaign money flooding the state's attorney general's race, and why is the parent company of APS making some of those sizable contributions? What's going on out there, Jeremy? Well, uh, Pinnacle West, the parent company of APS, gave $175,000, not directly to a campaign committee or something like that, but to the Republican Attorneys General uh, Association, which has been spending off the charts the last uh, month or so, trying to defeat Felicia Rodolini and get Mark Burnovich elected. Now, they have an obvious interest in, in one issue that's come up in this race, and uh, you know, they're fighting the EPA on these environmental rules and the Navajo generating station, although, interestingly enough, both candidates have come out against this and you know, opposed them very vociferously. Both have said they would be willing to sue. And I guess they don't really believe Rodolini will do, do that as much well as uh, Brnovich. Well, and the other part of it is the attorney general gets final say over rule changes at the Corporation Commission. We, we know or suspect from the non-denial denial from APS that they've also been trying to influence the Corporation Commission race. And they'd like a, a commission that's friendlier to them. They'd like some changes in, in solar rules. They'd like to, to deal with the legislature in terms of what the laws are in terms of taxability. And, you know, are they legally entitled to do that? Sure. But it's, it's unusual because, you know, I've been covering politics for a long time in the state. And usually the utilities would stay out of it figuring, you know, <laughs> we're not helping people by saying the people who send you those $300 bills want this candidate. Right, and this has, you know, this the APS wading into politics is, is really a new, new thing here in Arizona. I mean, the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court three years ago now opened the, it made it legal for corporations to spend that money, but APS has been on the sidelines. They've obviously made a corporate decision to, to engage. And uh, whether that backfires on them or well, not. Well, I guess in this case, at least their name is on this contribution because they have to, you know, Braga has to file these, uh, you know, disclosure statements with uh, the IRS. You know, APS is suspected of putting millions more into these dark money front groups, you know, the Arizona Free Enterprise Club, Save Our Future Now, that are just spending millions and millions in corporation commissioner race, governor's race. You know, a number of different races, uh, the Secretary of State's race in the primary, and everyone suspects it's APS. And as you mentioned, Howie, the non-denial denial said, well, we're not good. we don't discuss what kind of campaign activity we have, but we do, we do reserve well, the right to get involved, uh, if it, you know, if it suits our interests. But, but I think you're also making an assumption that, that Pinnacle West and APS knew that this was going to be disclosed. You've got to go dig through an IRS form 8860, you know, just not something we normally come across, to find the stuff. Look, if APS wanted to be upfront about it, if they wanted to spend 175000 they could do their own IE, independent expenditure. But instead, they chose to, to, to bundle Why? it with other folks. Why are they doing it? Why, if, if everyone, we now know APS's parent company is doing mm -hmm. this. Okay, so we know. Why not just go ahead and get your IE and spend the money? I think they didn't particularly want them their contributions to be an issue. If we saw an IE from the Pinnacle West PAC or something mm -hmm. else, and they do have their own political action committee, <clears throat> then we would clearly know and people would raise the question. I think they feel maybe if it's part of three and a half million that's being spent in a race, it's attenuated and somehow it doesn't count. And, and about, could, could it be also that it might be seen as a detriment to that candidate, them yeah. receiving money from a regular, the parent company of a regulated monopoly that sends you a bill every month? That's absolutely true, especially in the Corporation Commission race. I mean, they have not disclosed that they spend in that race. There's a great suspicion that they did and a non-denial, but <laughs> it could hurt the Republicans who have been, who went, the, the Republican team that won the primary were the ones that suppose that everyone believes were supported by APS. Um, and they're facing Democrats and there could be a backlash against. The funny Democrats. thing is that Jim Holloway, who was one of the Democrats, has made an issue of it on Twitter, but he hasn't been able to, to gather steam. If I'm Jim Holloway, I stand out in front of the APS office with a huge screw and say, these are the people who are bringing you your bill. These are the people who want Tom Ferris and, and Doug Little elected. Is this what you want? Right, now, and remember, it was just a few months ago that we had the big solar fight. 
that APS was trying to get this, the fee on to homeowners who rented mm -hmm. uh, or leased the solar panels, mm -hmm. and APS fought vociferously against that. Now the, now, the way you try to overcome some of that bad press in the Corpcom race, at least, is $1.3 million that one of these dark money groups that everyone suspects is funded by APS, uh, Save Our Future Now, $1.3 million they're spending in attack ads against Sander Kennedy. I don't think they've spent anything on Holway, but they're going after you know Kennedy pretty hard, and that's a lot more than you know this 175,000 in the AG's race, which is you know at least compared to the rest of the spending in that race, is kind of a drop in the why bucket. Are they go, why are they going after Kennedy? Um, I'm not I, sure why they've I chosen Kennedy over Holway. They might have decided she's the stronger of the two candidates. Yeah. Uh, it's probably something like that. They're, they're you looking look at, at spending like this in races, and you say, okay, somebody's spending. Ten million dollars to keep Howie from being elected. They probably think Howie's got a pretty yeah. good chance, or he's ahead, or they have some research that says we've got to beat him down. So well, there's, you, a, there's a reason for this. You've spending. got two things. Sandra has time on the commission. She had been a commissioner until she was defeated, she, and she's got name ID. Plus, you know, a nice name like Kennedy. You know, of course they, you know, they, they're going to attack her. Jim Holloway, That doesn't mean anything. It's it's a non-entity. Real quickly, before we get off this dark money contribution, uh, Secretary of State race, so some money dropped there, correct? Uh, yeah, this, um, the 60 plus association, which has been involved uh, in a few other races, most notably, you know, you know about 1.2 million or more in the governor's race, 300 grand they dropped in attack ads on Terry Goddard, and which is you know very ironic because much of this race has focused on the issue of dark money. Goddard's been campaigning on it; it's on his signs. And uh, Reagan, Michelle Reagan, the Republican opponent too, has been traditionally very opposed to this, but uh, you know hasn't really been talking about that as much lately. But now, if she ends up getting right. pushed over the top by this dark buddy, that and, would be kind of. And ironic. this is uh, another Koch brothers affiliated Republican leaning or Republican group. I mean, I think we fairly say that. Um, and you know why? Why at this point in the race you come in with this big a, a, a buy? It's kind oh, of surprising. Well, that, that, that comes back to what are the polls looking like? Mm -hmm. You know, the fact is Terry, again, household name, much more so, so than Michelle Reagan. Uh, certainly some polling suggests that he could, he could walk away with it in a Republican state. But if, he, if it, the polling shows he could walk away with it, do you spend your money on a race that you're likely to lose? It, it could show just the opposite, that Reagan is gaining ground and let's put some money in there. Oh, well, I, I, I think, look, this is one of those races that you know, we talk about the margin of error this is a race in the mm -hmm. margin of error. And, and so to the extent that you do have a state where Republicans outnumber Democrats, recognizing independents outnumber all of them, you know, you, 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 this is the last gasp. We had a, uh, the Congressional District 9 debate, uh, such as it was, <laughs> right here on the Arizona Horizon set. Uh, Kirsten Cinema showed, Libertarian Powell Gamel showed, uh, Wendy Rogers, the Republican candidate, a no show. Uh, has this been the, the way of the campaign? Has she, is she just avoiding folks like Diane Douglas is in the, uh, in the superintendent of public obstruction race? I mean, it could be. This is biz you know, pretty bizarre. Usually we're used to seeing front runners bailing out in debates and trying to stay away from these things. In this case, you have an overwhelming front runner in cinema you know, showing up in Rogers, who's clearly you know, perceived as being pretty far behind not showing up. Um, you know, I think we saw in the primary her debating skills are you know, certainly not quite what Kirsten Cinemas are. And, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, you know, apparently she thought she had more to lose than to gain by showing up, yeah. even though she's, you know, significantly behind. Even the national Republican groups aren't spending money to help her, really, because they view this, at, people view this as a race, they're, the Republicans and, just aren't competing. And what's, what's really strange is the variety of excuses that were offered. We knew about it, we can't do it till October. Well, we didn't know about it. Well, we did know about it, but just simply having you there instead of some panel of journalists from multi, multiple media was somehow unfair. Um, I don't know what's going on in her campaign, and maybe this is an indication of how, how yeah, poorly run right. it is. And it, I, it's just real quickly, since we were kind of involved in the story, I'd like to think that maybe one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing, because we were in contact <laughs> with them almost on a weekly basis from September, yeah. and to say that you were not aware of this when debate time rolls around is... Uh, not accurate. You mean it's yeah. October already? How'd yeah, that happen? Yeah. It, like I said, it may not be accurate here because you don't, I don't know what the situation is, but we don't like being part of these stories. Mm. And so it was uh, disconcerting to say yeah. the least. Right. Well, when I saw the, the update about, you know, remind, don't, don't forget tonight's debate on Tuesday. I, and I saw Wendy Rogers name missing. I called up Wendy Rogers folks and, and her press guy said, I don't know about any debate. Let me check. And well, which tells you that they didn't tell the press guy. That doesn't tell which, you that. Which suggests that he a campaign in, in, with some sort of trouble <clears throat> finding an equal. What? 
Kirsten Cinema was supposed to be one of, if not the most vulnerable of, of all the congressional candidates in two years' time. What happened? Is she that much of a dynamo? Why aren't some of these folks in that district going after her on the Republican side? Well, you know, you saw there's a lot of uh, prominent Republicans in that district who could probably put up a pretty good fight. None of them got into the race. You know, the reason, you know, Wendy Rogers is the nominee is because this race only came down to, you know, her and Andrew Walter. You know, folks like Sal DeCicio, folks like Hugh Hallman, you know, these folks didn't want to get into the race. And, you know, starting, you know, last summer, I think, that perception of, you know, cinema's going to be in trouble every two years really shifted. And, you know, it's a fundraising dynamo. She raced as hard as she could towards the center. It's put up this super moderate image that really, you know, it's a big shift from where she was in the legislature back in the day. But she looks pretty strong. But she, she has also done good constituent service. She's here. You know, these are ground games. This isn't like a U.S. senator, you can kind of you know, do John McCain and you know, go on the Sunday morning talk shows and come back every six years. Uh, this is a ground game. She's been here. She's been doing the constituent service. She's been doing the work. She's been talking to folks. And that makes a difference. For a district that didn't know what to think of her, now they, now they know who right. they've got. And when this district was created a couple of years ago and had its first election in 28, uh, 2012, no one really knew the, how it would shift. It was, a, it was obviously a split district. It could go either way. We got the results in and we saw, okay, Cinema won three or four points, if memory serves me well. And, and she has done nothing but solidify that. And I think the Republicans looked at it and said, no, we're going to spend our money on CD1. And exactly. which they have spent millions on CD1 to try to get Andy Tobin to defeat Kirk and, Patrick. And CD2. And CD2. And, CD2. Yeah, and that's saying. exactly. Three competitive <clears throat> districts, and they're breaking the bank in two of them, but yeah, ignoring CD9. Uh, CD1 and, and CD2, I think, are number two and number three in the nation for yeah. congressional wow. spending. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mitt Romney campaigning for a Doug Deuce. Was it yesterday? Yeah, last night. You were there? Yeah, so probably you know, hundreds, maybe <laughs> more than a thousand people, you know. Mitt, a lot of uh, a lot of folks who uh, reminiscing about what might have been had uh, he won the election two years ago, and uh, saying we all we don't want the same thing to happen to uh, good old Doug Ducey. Let's all get behind him. You know, this is typical of the way the Ducey campaign has been. It's he doesn't want to answer questions. He doesn't want Mitt Romney to answer questions. You know, I would have gone had we actually had an opportunity to say, Mitt, what is it you like about Doug Ducey? You know, Doug, what is it you like about Mitt? But they're doing this sort of 10,000-foot campaign, and he's figuring he's ahead, depending on which polls you're talking to. And if we can just cruise along without anybody asking us any questions, well, we'll do just but, fine. But, okay, but if you are uh, ahead and you are at 10,000 feet, why, why, why chance a touch and go? Just stay up there and cruise. You know, that's, that's probably true. And he did this very well successfully in the primary, where two, two weeks before the end of the primary is a six-way slugfest. Um, he disengaged, and uh, and we're seeing it. And he had been casting himself as a front runner. By a couple weeks before, it was it was a fait accompli. I mean, this thing on with Mitt Romney last night was dubbed a victory celebration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're they're trying. They're following through on their game plan. And they're very. They're, this is a very well run campaign. And I this think. goes to the other thing that happened today, where where Fred Duval had a press conference to once again say, I'm for education and he's not. Now he ratcheted up the language somewhat, but it's nothing we haven't heard before. Fred is out there trying to flail about. Now, I don't think it helped him that he used the opportunity of being endorsed by a teacher's union to, to, to go ahead and say, I'm pro education and he's not. Fred is left, left he, he's, he's, he's punching at, at shadows in this well, thing because there's nobody there punching back. You, you've, you've got Doug out there just, oh, I, well, I'm, you know, I'm in, along. In, in this governor's race, I mean, Fred Duvall set himself up from day one. His issue was going to be restoring education funding. He hoped to get big backing from business for try, because that's a big business, business issue. They're not getting the type of graduates they need. And uh, Duval, uh, Ducey successfully, I think, you know, counterpunched him on the education, tried to take the wind out of his sails, and he's finally now today saying, getting very aggressive with the education push, saying, that, you know, <laughs> yeah. And how many <clears throat> days after early voting started did right. this did this occur? You know, well, I think it might be kind of telling that you know, if you went to this debate la or the rally last night, they didn't even really talk about Duval that much. I think they spent more time talking about the rest of the Republican ticket and mm -hmm. you know, Romney and Ducey and Jeff Flake and everyone else saying, hey, everyone, make sure you tell all your friends and neighbors to vote because we've got a great ticket all down the line. They were all standing up there on stage. They 
almost seemed yeah. like they were kind of shifting their focus to, hey, let's worry about Brnovich and Reagan and uh, yeah. you know Douglas. And on a side note, they were collecting early ballots at that <laughs> event last night, no. which they had just, yeah, absolutely. Is that had, legal? Apparently it is, okay. and the Republicans and, and, like and doing this, it. The, and this is the most fascinating thing of what, what occurred this week, this hidden video, this hidden camera. I mean, <laughs> security camera. You know, somebody brought in a, you know, some early ballot, so clearly a Democratic group. Oh, my God, there's massive fraud. And then when you talk to A.J. LaFaro from the Maricopa County Republican Party, well, we do it too, but we're trustworthy. We can't trust right. them. Right, and, and not only are we trust, but it's harder for us to collect them because people, you know, Republican voters are, are a little more careful about who they give their ballot to. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, 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 the, the conversation was quite uh, yeah. intense. Well, yeah. it was so silly to call it fraud because, I mean, it's extremely well known that, you know, people are allowed to do this. We had this right. giant legislative battle a couple of years ago for this. You know, people referred it to the ballot. The, you know, this law would have made this illegal, and that was one of the main planks of the law. You know, it got referred to the ballot for referendum. They repealed it to not have to deal with it, and everyone knew, okay, well, right. now this is still both, illegal. Both parties do this. Um, they do it with shut-ins. They do it with low propensity voters. The Democrats have more of those, and they stand to gain more, and so they're, um, yeah, so it's an issue. Before we leave the governor's race, uh, Duval, uh, clarifying, I think, or attempting to clarify parental <laughs> consent, what's going on well, here? Well, he, he let his mouth get ahead of his brain. Uh, there, is, there has been an issue going back, you know, well, since Roe v. Wade, but going back to the Politown administration about parental consent. And there's a general feeling that if you're a minor, you know, much the same way you can't get body parts pierced without parental consent, you shouldn't have an abortion, which is a major procedure. And Fred said, well, I'm for allowing girls as young as 14 to get an abortion without parental consent. What he failed to point out and is now backpedaling on is that is the law in this state with judicial bypass. Essentially, a court, you, if, you, if you say, look, I, my parents will kill me or I'm the victim of incest, you go to the court, you prove you're mature enough, a judge evaluates it and then decides yes or no. He never mentioned that tiny little part, so, we, so obviously they're saying, look, he wants your 14-year-old to go get an abortion. Right. Is, is that and an example of a novice campaign? He knows what he's talking about, but he's not expressing it in the way that helps his that, campaign. That was, that was a clear mistake. Um, it opened him up to an attack. Um, but you know, what voters is he going to lose from that? He's not going to lose any of the Republicans because they're already against him. Um, he's probably not going to lose you know, he's not going to gain any Democrats by saying it. So, but he would have. I mean, it is a novice campaign mistake. He should have. He should have been briefed on that. Those questions should have been asked before. Yeah, and, you know, and of course, in a church of all places, where he said this, being interviewed by a pastor. But this is an issue where <clears throat> you see like two to one public opinion in favor of needing parental consent. It's something he didn't. He didn't really need to go there. <laughs> he, no. could, he could have yeah. deflected. Well, I was saying because you don't right. even need. And, 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 it doesn't even need to be an abuse or rape or incest issue. His, you can tell the judge. You know, they just have to determine. Well, I'm. She's mature enough to make this decision on her own, so we'll let this go forward. And the bottom line is, I mean, his clarification came out and said, well, of course I'm not in favor of changing the current parental uh, consent law. Well, the Republicans control the legislature. It, even if he was elected, he's not going to be able to change the law. Abortion yeah. rights, uh, are they, they don't, are they going to be a factor? I, are they a factor? Because these two, they, they're very, they're polar opposites now. At one point, abortion was much more of a high profile issue. I think that the, the issue is that We've gone as far as we can short of overturning Roe v. Wade. You know, they pushed it at the, at the limits. We've got, you know, you have to be a certain number of miles from, from, uh, from a clinic, you know, new clinic regulations as far as what equipment you have to have online. Nurse practitioners can no longer do Medicaid abortions, things like that. It hasn't been as much of an issue because there's not much left. Now, gay rights has become the higher issue, and particularly now well, in the wake of, of, let's, of, of there. Let's, let's go there, yeah. then. Uh, there's already rumblings that 1062.1 will have to be yes. uh, revisited because of gay marriage in Arizona. What are you hearing? Well, we already knew something was coming back. You know, there was no question when it was uh, vetoed last time that the proponents, long before gay marriage was, was even an issue, said, we need some protections for individuals. You shouldn't have to photograph a wedding, a gay wedding, if it's against your religion, you have to bake a cake. What the gay marriage decision did, and Horn deciding not to appeal it, is it now created a real issue here. We had an issue in Maricopa County Superior Court where a clerk said, yes. I am against giving 
permits and licenses to gay couples. Well, they reassign the person, which is what you do. But now you've got an issue of, well, should a bakery be able to say, I'm not baking gay wedding right. cakes? Should, should a public- a chapel. A public, should a chapel. <laughs> all of this it, stuff. It's coming back. Kathy Herod, the, the day that, uh, last Friday when the Ninth Circuit, or when uh, Judge Sedwick, uh, U.S. District Court, overturned Arizona's ban, she sent out a press release saying uh, that down, buried down in it says we're going to redouble our efforts to protect religious rights. You know it's coming back mm -hmm. um, and the legislature knows it's coming back. I talked to some Republicans, I talked to one Republican this, this week who really didn't want to engage but he said you know how many times do we have to touch the well, hot stove? And that's a good, does the, <clears throat> it may be coming back to the legislature, does the legislature want it to come back? A lot of them I don't think they do and a lot of the people who voted for this you know, this past year, you know, they, you know, so many of them immediately backtracked and said, hey, you know, Governor Brewer, please veto this. We don't want it anymore. And, uh, you know, those people are not going to vote for this again. And, you know, and even if the next, if the next governor is Doug Ducey, who's obviously a big ally of Kathy Herrick, also a big ally of the Chamber of Commerce, and the same people who said, oh, God, we're going to lose the Super Bowl. Governor Brewer, please get rid of this thing. Well, this what, is, what, you know, that's going to be an well, interesting we'll, tug of war, just as it was with Brewer. We'll see what, what, bill proposal gets dropped, it had, it had better be as narrow as you can write a bill that says if you're providing wedding services, period, then possibly, then you, and you have a religious exemption or a religious objection to gay marriage, then you don't have to do it. Well, but if they write it anywhere near as broad as they did last year where, I mean, anyone could object well, to anything. Well, but here's the thing. The fact is that the bill that Steve Yarbrough had last year was narrower than one that would have been pre vetoed the prior year for over technical reasons, because mm -hmm. they sent her, her the governor something when she said, send uh, me the budget. Steve Yarbrough, to his credit, has tried. He talks about sincerely held, presumptions there. I think you can craft it better. Now, Doug Ducey, and you and I both had this conversation with him, well, what about 1062? Well, I would have vetoed it. Well, what about if it comes back? I would have vetoed, you know. Yeah, he's, I will he's, not he's, sign 1062. Exactly. What about yeah, some other version yes. of 1062? Would you sign that? He won't answer that but question. But how is a legislature going to handle conscious-based objections? I mean, how, what are they going? They're going to have to do something. You know they are. They have to do something. I mean, in some cases, like we've seen with the county clerks, they probably won't really have to because, you know, we've seen that they already can make these kinds of objections. You know, members of the clergy, of course, would make those kinds of objections. I just don't know what they do. They have to do something that is different from what was in yeah. 1060. You bring the exact same bill back. What if you put a different You're, number to it? Oh, God help yeah. them if they can put the same number on it. Yeah. Paul yeah. Boyer, think, who is a big supporter of this legislation, said we cannot have yeah. the same number on it. Yeah. We need to do something, but it can't have. Well, but, it but can't be 1062. There actually is precedent. We have laws in the state that say doctors no, do not need to perform abortions. We have laws in the state that say if you're a pharmacist, you do not need to dispense birth control pills, which is fine if you happen to be living in Phoenix, you can go up the street. The issue has always been, well, what if you're the only pharmacy in, in Winslow or someplace like that? So there is precedent that there are laws in the books that could serve as models. Or if I'm the pharmacy owner and I find out you're saying no to half the people that come to the, to the, to the window, I, I decide to fire you, another yeah. legal situation. Oh, they, they, these are all sorts of employment situations there in terms of, of how that occurs. And then you've got to decide, can this only be closely held corporations, you know, the hobby lobbies of the world that are, that are individually mm -hmm. owned? Or are we talking about <laughs> you know, a corporation which is publicly held. Now, what are, are their rights different? Citizens United said corporations, corporations are people. Corporations are people too. Yes. When you get to the, uh, you know, wedding cake or photographer example too, you know, this all emanated from a case in New Mexico mm -hmm. where I believe a photographer was sued. They have a different law in New Mexico yeah. that allowed that lawsuit to go forward that we don't have in Arizona. So the already, I mean, but, if you talk to the opponents of 1062, that, you know, they'll, tell, they'll say that kind of undercuts, ex, you know, ex, the, the alleged need for this law except, in the first place. Except everything changed with Judge Sedwick's decision. Once you define marriage in this state as any two people, can you decide that the only marriages, you know, whether or not we change the laws are the only marriages that count here? I mean, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. We have a law in the books that said married couples, man and woman, married couples get preference in adoption. Does that automatically mean that now any married couple gets preference or do we have to change the laws? Everything changed with Judge Sedwick's yeah. decision. Exactly. And we did have Dan Barr on talking about some of those things and he doesn't think there's going to be quite as much difference as people think. You got about 30 seconds here. Right. Well, the one thing you said is are women's rights going to be an issue in this, in this race? Uh, and abortion, maybe not. I think Democrat get out to vote seven, they're more concerned about uh, birth control, access to birth mm -hmm. control and those type of things. I saw, uh, you know, support women's health, vote Democrat, right? 
driving down the street to the studio tonight. All right, we got to stop it there, gentlemen. Good stuff. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton stops by to discuss a variety of city issues, and a new report ranks Arizona as the Southwest's leader in energy efficiency. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, a look at Phoenix's efforts to create shade and a cooler living environment. Wednesday, we'll talk to a best-selling author on the dangers of wheat. Thursday, how a small downtown jazz club is drawing a big following. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.